excavating an old thing. So some scholars have argued that the first artwork um, probably appeared on human beings and that people started to paint their bodies, decorate their hair, develop jewelry, tattooing, all sorts of ways to um, pick the human body and turn it into a cultural object. And uh, people have done this through clothing. Um, some of the earliest domesticated crops are fibers such as cotton, uh, developed in several areas of the world, it became an important um, element for clothing. Also, domestication of the animals in the Americas, the animals on pacas, where the wool could be used um, for making uh, garments, also, in some of the most spectacular objects we've had here at the museum were made of uh, dyed wool. And also, Version of feather working. Um, most societies throughout the world have figured out that like tropical bird feathers make great ornaments, and then also um, exploring metals such as gold, silver, copper, and other materials um, throughout, throughout the world, especially in the Americas. In the Americas, people sort of took decorating the body to uh, incredible extremes, and um, we now know from a number of intact areas, primarily on the coast of Peru, but also some from and then some fantastic finds in my area, uh, Mexico, is that um, people went to great efforts to decorate the body. So this is the Lord of Sipan, um, burial that dates to about 600 AD to about 1000 AD from the north coast of Peru. And this individual you see here is one of seven garments that he was buried with um, outfits, probably um, as the leader of the society probably had to serve in a number of very important rituals, and so there were separate garments for each particular uh, role that he played within the Moche State Society. Others have been found, it's rare to find these complete ones because most of the tombs have been uh, looted and disturbed uh, long ago. Um, this is one from the Sikhan culture, excavated by one of my colleagues, um, also had multiple outfits. Um, and you notice here, the kinds of things carrying uh, staffs and things in the arms, decoration of the ears, the piercing of the ears, and bedding them with large ear spools, you can see ear rods in the case of Sifu Ponte, and then the very fine buoyant headdresses, a tower, and you can look um, So let's move to Panama. And um, most of us know about the incredible cultures of the Incas and the Andean region, uh, the Maya and Aztecs from further north, and virtually Central America gets ignored in a lot of um, museum exhibits um, and also um, in terms of archaeological excavations. But there have been a number of key excavations done here going back to sort of the beginnings of archaeology in the Americas. And I want to talk about one particular site called Sitio Conte, um, it's generally known as part of the Cople culture, uh, dated to about 750, 880 to about 1,000 AD, a very short period of time, as you see, um, created some spectacular objects. Panama is a tropical area, so um, it's, um, in this part of Panama, it's seasonal, so you get heavy rainfalls, so tropical rains every day for about six, seven months, and then you have a dry spell of the rest of the year when it can actually um, get pretty dusty and dry, um, and you won't see rain for quite a while. And this is the um, um, the Grand River of Cocle comes out of the little hills um, and empties into the Pacific Ocean. And it was along this river, um, like many tropical rivers, they carry lots of water during the rainy season, sometimes going over their banks. And they tend to eat away into the sides of the banks, especially at the curves. And so uh, they're continually sort of cutting in and depositing soil further downstream. And um, in the 1920s, uh, local landowners and communities along the river noticed um, that gold was being washed out uh, of the riverbanks um, and, and as the water dropped during the dry season on some of the beaches and you could find uh, golden objects strewn on the surface itself. And um, at the site of the Sitio Ponte shown here in a fairly recent slide, um, not much is left of the site itself today, we think that there could be more. Um, this is where um, they located the actual origin of where this gold was coming from some strata, um, probably the tombs that were being kind of eaten away by, by the changing of the course. And so um, the local landowner kind of shooed everybody away, um, said we're going to do our own excavations. They got some workmen together, did some uh, 
uh, holes in the ground here and there. They didn't find anything spectacular, although they did find um, what appears to be some kind of a, a very important stone wall that surrounded the site. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, but they knew it was important, so they actually, um, with the finding this goal, they asked Harvard University, um, the Peabody Museum at Harvard, um, and Samuel J. Lothrop was the excavator who came down with the team and worked three short seasons from 1930 to 1933. And um, he was a wonderful archaeologist. Excavations. 
Another important person that Mason brought down was John Forney, who was a, a young um, volunteer at the museum. I think he was probably independently wealthy, so we have much evidence of having a uh, sort of career as so he went to work, but he spent a lot of time at the museum. He also had taken some anatomy classes and got an anthropology degree at Harvard University. And so um, he was brought down to be essentially a physical anthropologist to work with any skeletal remains that they found. His wife, Julia Corning, came along too. She was probably one of the most important people on the day. She uh, kept track of all the thousands and thousands of objects that came out of the excavations, um, made, developed the list that we were using to uh, create an exhibit and also to sort of re-excavate the site that, um, many decades later. And um, also um, did most of the fine excavation work of many of the gold objects that you see in the exhibit, you see in some of the photographs that show them in. Another interesting character that went down was John Mason Jr. So he was the son of J. Alden Mason. They took him out at Tech Deffer in high school in his senior year, and I had the opportunity to come down to Panama to work on a dig. And so he was kind of the jack of all trades. He, bit of everything. It was also responsible for essentially guarding the site at night, in some cases actually sleeping on the burials to um, make sure no one disturbed them um, so we could continue to work the next day. So the excavation proceeded quite smoothly, especially with the um, expertise and the previous knowledge of the site by the Senator J. Loper. And um, they um, broke up the workers into teams and then assigned um, two of the uh, staff members to each excavation unit. And um, they could carry on four or five different operations at the same time. So they found um, about seven or eight caches, we call them. So these are um, collections of objects that were intentionally placed in, in the ground, um, usually without bones. And then other ones, they were labeled as burials, where they actually were skeletal remains. Then they excavated the second trench, and they found over 30 um, individual burials and also caches. So in the main trench, they came down on what we recognize as sort of a burial floor, and um, it was the most spectacular thing they found up to this point. So it was um, 12, indi uh, was eight individuals, mostly males, um, and, and three of them were old men that were highlighted in the exhibit, um, which you may have seen. And they're all oriented, they're, they're so the, here are the skeletons that you make out are very, very poorly preserved, and so they have some of the long bones. They were described as being almost like dust when they excavated them. So they very carefully tried to clear them, they bring in the physical anthropologist, Horny, who would try to make determinations of the age and sex of the individuals if he could. He was very conservative, and he um, only would venture um, a decision unless he was very, very sure of this. So um, we have, uh, we can identify about half of the individuals um, in here according to uh, whether they're male or female um, and something about their age. Um, you can see here a um, number of the objects that many of the objects have been removed uh, when this photograph was taken. You see these clusters of entire whole pots there. We assume these pots probably had food in them, possibly drink, um, although none of this was recovered, unfortunately that we're doing residue analysis um, in the future to see if we can detect maybe what was in them. Uh, the bodies are packed pretty tight together, and in some cases, one on top of the other. All of the individuals found in this tomb were face down, which is uh, very rare in the Americas. And then, after they had very carefully reported that first level of those eight individuals, they started excavating down, and about three feet later, going through layers of layers and layers of whole pots that have been placed very carefully um, on top of the next layer. And so um, they were sort of excavating this kind of funnel shape as they're going down deep. And then they hit right at the bottom of it, they hit probably the waist of uh, two of the most important uh, individuals, well, certainly the, probably the most important ever been down in the Americas at this time. And um, so you can see some sort of little donut shaped little rings there on a little line in the center of the image. Those are large, giant, heavy beads that were uh, around the waist, probably a belt made of gold. And um, you see pottery that were placed um, uh, on top of the, the back of the individuals in the center of the tomb. 
So then they expanded the excavation out to get a better context of the whole thing, see where the edges were. That took them um, um, almost two weeks to do that. Um, and you know, they were trying to get this stuff recorded as quickly as possible. They knew the rains were coming soon. And Mason was continually checking, you can see in his notes, he's checking uh, how much money he has left. He's going through you know, his excavation funds. He's sending uh, desperate uh, telegrams to the museum, begging for more money to finish this excavation. Shows um, Julia Corning, who wrote Merrill reporting meticulously every single um, individual bead in this location. And you see um, one of the most spectacular photographs from the dig, something like 300 photographs um, from very large format cameras, which are um, high growth resolution. You can see some of the armbands in uh, sort of the lighter color. You can see a pile of the large plaques right here, and then a conference headdress at the top, two pairs of what we call ear rods of gold, and a whole pile of ear rods at the uh, bottom here that were between the two uh, the legs of two individuals, probably uh, were originally in a bag or a basket that decomposed um, sort of spare jewelry that these individuals were kept. Then, um, so this was clear, and it was 12 individuals. Um, the ones that could be identified were male. Um, there was one interesting female, which I'll talk about in a minute, and one was identified as possibly a juvenile, um, a young adult, um, also had been included in this particular excavation. The, um, you see in this um, scene of the trench, how deep they are, in this, in the middle there, right here, and look at this mass of pot over here. And this comes down from where the original surface was, probably somewhere around here, and lines the two so it's, it's a shape kind of like a, a, a deep bowl, flat bottom bowl. And what they've done is they've taken literally hundreds of pottery vessels, very carefully stacked them to essentially mine this, this pit that they've had to place the bodies in. But you never know what might be below. So they start digging down through the third level, and they found another level with uh, three individuals. Um, and right just above the water table, very poorly preserved um, bodies. So um, this is the lower level, and they were very rushed because the rains had started to come, uh, the water table starts to rise, um, and they very officially got the materials out and poured them. But the reason why we can do so much with this collection, and I worked, when I, when I started archaeology, one of the first things do. Somebody said, okay, here's some old notes, here's some old photographs, here's some old collection that somebody excavated 20, 30 years ago. Makes sense of it, of course. And you really learn who takes good notes and who takes bad notes, whether the photographs are usable or not, whether they use any kind of precise measurements to record the objects. And so this is uh, some very simple devices, but they were ahead of their time. Um, and so this is a little grid that Merrill developed. Um, so it's three feet by three feet with divisions that string crisscrosses into a grid, and that can be placed over the objects so you can locate the corner on a predetermined reference point. You photograph it over the objects, then you take it off and do another photograph in the same place, um, so it's sort of out of place. So you can always measure exactly where the objects are. And you also develop this crude ladder system here where you can get up there and perch yourself above and take vertical pictures, um, have less distortion. Um, and these are it's a very simple devices, but um, allow us to essentially, we can re-excavate and re-excavate and re-excavate this collection uh, for new findings. So this is um, a visualization of um, the bodies in the three layers, well, layer, um, upper layer, middle layer, and lower layer. And then a profile drawing section there shows you the relationships of these three um, layers. Now, in the um, so this shows um, some of the massive pottery. Um, the cafe probably put in at least a thousand vessels who were lining the, um, the sides of this large pit. And um, why were they doing this? Well, it's probably part of the offering. It's a construction in a sense. So this isn't just a burial, it's actually a tomb. Uh, it's been very carefully prepared. We think that all these vessels probably had food and possibly drink, possibly corn beer. And there's actually little pathways that kind of come down from the sides because they had to come in and out of this thing. And so putting the bodies and, and uh, placing the offerings is there are sort of like little pathways of smashed pottery. They couldn't 
could avoid smashings of coming in and out of this, um, this uh, deep pit. So probably um, the thing that attracts most attention, um, both in past exhibits and also various publications that have come out on the site, are the, um, the individual, or actually two individuals, in the very center of the middle layer. And so you can see the pile of um, shiny objects here, which are black and white photograph. Most of that is gold, but also resin objects, and objects made of uh, whale teeth and other animal teeth um, that were related to very spectacular objects. So a lot of this was sort of reconstructing the excavation from the incredible records. We have these diary records, um, sometimes might be every couple of minutes, there was a diary entry, especially when they're excavating something important. Um, we have field notes um, that are more detailed about some descriptions of what they're finding, um, within paragraph forms, kind of bullet, kind of bullet point this. Then we have a set of photographs and um, all kinds of field drawings that allowed us to sort of go back through the collection, uh, primarily to decide which objects we wanted to show and exhibit. But we're finding as we were doing this, the inventory work, we're actually coming up with some new um, interpretations. So this is um, Kate, um, Kate Moore um, in the center with Lucy Fowler Williams, the um, co-curator of the exhibit, and Julie Lawler, who is bending over here looking at the object. She put together all the broken pots that you see in the collection, uh, painstaking work over the periods of month. And Monica Fenton was one of our undergraduates. So much of the work of call it re-engineering or recontextualization of all these objects. So we can actually try to show them and exhibit for the first time in their location where they're actually found. And so in the past, the exhibits were always beautiful gold objects with terrible lighting coming down on them on a black felt background and uh, you know, basically, but not no, completely out of their context. So um, Monica Fenn, uh, Samantha Saylor, Sarah Parkinson, Ashley Terry spent incredible numbers of hours uh, going through the collection, the old notes, transcribing almost illegible diary notes that had literally pages of sort of buckled a bit, where you can see that the, the person writing was dripping with sweat on the page, you know, and blurring the, the, the field notes and things like this. Um, but they were able to um, pretty much, um, probably about 99% um, transcribe these, um, which provided an incredible record for doing some detailed reconstructions. So in the exhibit, um, um, Monica Fenton said there's three individuals that we should maybe focus on, and they have some very interesting objects that kind of contrast with what we see from some of the rest. So this is the upper level of Highway 3, who are described as old men. Um, so um, they had been placed together with a whole series of objects. So this is kind of our reconstruction work that Monica did. Um, where she would take the plans and then bring in images that we had photographed uh, recently in inventory work and then try to lo painstakingly locate them on this. Uh, so this is kind of a working diagram to recontextualize things. And these individuals um, were certainly not the center of attention of this 23 person burial, but um, they were very important. They had some gold object, objects and spectacular carved um, agate very hard stone materials that you see in the exhibit. You see one of them here that's a beautiful sort of orange uh, pink stone. Um, Adzes or celts, and we sort of call them uh, axe blades uh, that were found in them. And a number of very exotic pots that probably relate to uh, trade with outside groups. Another individual that Monica said we should focus on after she done some of this recontextualization work was um, a, a, a young woman very um, to the side of the central individuals, you can see her here. And she had a very different outfit from anybody else. She had this um, around her waist area, she had these beautiful little triangular pieces of gold, as a spindle little piece of gold up this big. Um, and they're in the exact shape and size of um, shark's teeth that we also found in the, um, in the excavations. And they probably formed a sort of a sequin. Um, probably a pubic protector of the belt, so in the front like this, and um, sewn on to probably a cotton or some kind of other fabric backing. Um, she also had um, uh, necklaces or uh, waist bands of some um, the teeth of 70 individual dogs um, that um, provided another kind of decoration around her waist. And then also she had ear spools, which is very interesting to know. 
consider these to be uh, markings of high status. Then the two major individuals that everybody in the past had focused on, um, and we assumed that most of the gold objects were not actually in anatomical position, so you know, they weren't necessarily worn everything, some of those. But it had actually been placed on the back of the individual as an offering, and then to that layer to build up, the next layer put on, and then the thing pulled up to the surface. And so um, we were fascinated with these two individuals, one on top of each other, facing down, and what we might be able to do with that. So this is Monica's uh, drawing of locations of the objects that we have, and then finding their exact location on the photographs and the maps, sort of going between photographs and maps, all scaled together. And you can see some of this distribution. And the first thing was, so what is anatomical position and what isn't? Um, and we find that most of this actually um, was on the objects, but they've been disturbed a bit by the decomposition of the bodies. So since this was the most spectacular find, look, thankfully they took lots of pictures of it. So they typically, you know, we try to get a nice shot from above, you know, sort of directly above off the ladder. And then they took pictures from the sides and stuff, um, just to kind of record it. And uh, so I thought, I could talk to some friends. They said, there's a, a program I can give you that you pull all these images together, and as long as they're from different angles, you can create a three-dimensional model of the scene. So I put these together. It took me a long time to sort of figure this out. So this is sort of looking straight down on it. So this is a composite of um, six separate photographs. But you can actually then take this 3D model and kind of turn it onto its side doesn't look very beautiful, but you can actually see some slight differences of the layering of the different objects. So the light stuff is gold, um, there's pottery in there, and other objects. So we can actually see differences, sort of essentially stratigraphic differences. So what happened was these two bodies decked out in incredible outfits of gold and other things, probably textiles too, that were not preserved. And then the bodies decompose, everything kind of gets compressed over time. It almost looks like it's all smushed down to one level, but it's actually not. And so we began to sort through some of this, and we can actually develop what we think are two individual costumes that these, these two central individuals wore. So this is the person on the top, uh, person A, we call him, and he, had th he or she had three large plaques. Um, the one on the, uh, this one here, unfortunately not in the exhibit, but it's traveling with um, Indiana Jones exhibit at the National Geographic Society, it's up in Canada now. And then some of the incredible pendants, like the Jaguar Emerald pendant, seen in the exhibit, and um, another anthropomorphic figure, very heavy cast gold, um, and ear rods that were in the ears, probably had fallen a little bit out of place as the body decomposed. The second individual had an outfit almost as spectacular, maybe more spectacular in some ways. Had two smaller plaques, probably placed as we've uh, shown them in the, um, in the exhibit. Um, these incredible armbands um, are decorated with uh, a robust uh, decoration coming down the sides, and also cuffs around the, um, the wrists. And so um, we went through a lot of permutations about how to dress this individual. So um, in, my, in most previous depictions, they always place the this and then sort of hung on the chest. Um, but if this individual had three of them, you know, maybe you'd put them in different locations. So we think that um, they were probably, um, to really show them off, we think they were probably on the shoulders and actually in the position of Lothrop's um, main burial that he excavated a decade earlier um, seemed to indicate that. Um, also, the individual had a very elaborate helmet-like um, headpiece that was um, covered with gold sequins, um, some uh, 48 sequins, and then probably had some kind of a tassel or maybe a braid that came down the back with three gold discs on it um, to decorate some kind of a dangler that probably went down the back. Um, we know from Spanish descriptions um, very early in the colonial period the Spanish were crazy about gold, so they found these peoples had gold, the descendants of the people from this tomb, and so um, they wanted to get this gold. They landed very early when the village to village. Um, some of the native peoples resisted them, some didn't. Um, and they get great descriptions, also from um, Florida and other um, areas of the Americas where we have early accounts, um, 
chiefs generally tended to decorate themselves with these large discs. In some cases, they were large shell discs, um, and others, um, such as Cinder Conte, um, uh, large golden discs with all kinds of incredible headdresses, uh, belts, and um, in this case, tattooing or body And um, these, these are elements that probably were used maybe not in day-to-day -day life, but for special occasions. But we even know from the Spanish description, some 500 years after this, um, this burial, that the chiefs actually went to war wearing their gold objects. Um, it was part of their sort of war outfit, um, the dazzle of the enemy. So um, looking at some of these objects, um, so this is the um, apron-like um, belt that the woman wore. Um, so each of these has two little tiny holes in it and we assume it's sewn to some kind of a backing, um, possibly cotton. Them. And one of the things we tried to do is we did not just focus on the gold, but to show off the incredible resin objects, the objects that are created from um, um, whale ivory and um, other things. So uh, these are um, some just incredible objects. It's been called outlay. So they actually created the form in a carbonated bone, or in this case, uh, some of these ones at the bottom here are of resin. It's a tree resin, it's like a sap, and then it hardens into a rock-like uh, substance, uh, very shiny also, which is something you're probably more attracted to. And um, they covered it with this gold leaf um, that um, in some cases were very well preserved in the object. In some of the organic cases, the actual um, attachments are, are gone because of the ore that they attached to it. So let's look at, uh, just very, very briefly at how they did this um, gold. So much of this work was done by human breath. And so you have to raise the temperature up high enough to melt metals such as gold. And most of the gold that you see in this exhibit are actually alloys. So they're combinations of gold, silver, and copper to certain degrees. And um, we think, at least from most of the early eyewitness accounts, that they raise the temperature by blowing through sort of hollow bamboo like wee tubes, usually with a, um, a little cap on the end to protect the end from getting caught catching on fire. Uh, usually a pot ring, so we could actually stick this right into the kiln and by uh, doing blowing, blowing, blowing to get the force up to raise the temperature. So a bunch of spectacular pieces there are the gold um, uh, plaques, what we call them. Um, this is from sheet metal, and, and if you look very carefully at the sides of these things, you'll see how incredibly uniform they are in thickness. And that's not easy to do with the kind of technology they have, essentially hammer stones on a handle. The other problem with working gold um, is that it tends to get a little brittle as you hammer it. So you have to keep putting it back into your kiln to kind of recharge it. Um, it's a sort of a renewal process. You don't melt it down again, but you heat it up again so then you can continue working on it. Because if it's too brittle, then you get a break in it and you've got to start all over again. And this is, this is a technique called repose or embossing, where they're actually pressing down from the back side to sort of pop out on the front side um, the designs that you see, these spectacular designs in low relief. And you can see how they catch the, the light um, in the exhibit hall there. Um, imagine that if someone's wearing that in the bright sun. Um, probably the most spectacular pieces, though, are the smaller ones um, with lots of detail. And so we'll take the uh, giant wire emerald here. The emerald probably came from Colombia, um, because there um, aren't any emeralds in this part of Central America. Um, when we think of a lot of the gold work was done locally. And this is a technique called lost wax casting. And so what they do to create this is, you, uh, if you're making a solid object, you will um, take beeswax, and this was a domesticated bee that um, is a, called a stingless bee, produces this fine wax. Take the wax and then you carve into it, probably with a thorn or something sharp that you can use, like a needle like thing. Carve all your designs into it. And then you dip this in a fine bath of almost pure clay, very fine clay. You build up a surface line. Then you start packing clay around it. And you put in vent tubes. So what you want to do is have a tube, a large tube that you pour your gold into it. But you don't want any air bubbles in it. So you want it to flow through to get all the air out of it. And so you see, this is actually a mistake here. If you look carefully at the exhibit, you see that was probably an air bubble that trapped it. And so you pile up the clay into sort of a, put 
puts it most of probably sort of cylindrical in shape molds. You put it in the kiln, so you're essentially firing the, the, the mold. The wax flows out as it gets hot, leaving a void inside it. Then you take your hot mold and probably pour it in very quickly through the thing. It goes down the roof. What was it good for? It drives all the air out. And then you can immediately take this and just toss it in a bucket of water, and it goes poof, and uh, uh, your, your mold falls apart in pieces, exposing this incredible object. Still has the air vent things on it, which you know are filled with gold too. So you just snap those off. You can see where they sort of um, polish down those points. Um, so you can you can even tell in most cases um, how how they were made because the vents are very careful. Now, one of the other things is they're working with alloys. But if you look at some of the, especially those plaques with the light shining on them, they look like pure gold. They got that gold color to them. So some of them are more reddish, and that's the copper inside them. But what they've done is they've taken unpure gold and created a surface that is pure gold through what we call the completion gilding. And so what you do is you take your finished plaque. And you essentially you call pickling it. You put it in an acid bath. Usually, um, these plants that have a, a sort of high acidic content, uh, fruit juices and stuff, uh, chocolate plants can use these. And it eats away at the copper again. So it's copper, gold, silver, right? And and it's essentially corroding the copper. Gold doesn't corrode, right? So then you put it in the fire, you warm it up, and then you take it out, soak it some more. And it gets this crusty kind of black and blue gray surface on it. So if you ever see copper when it, when it oxidizes, right, it gets that blue green color. And then you take, um, and then you can sort of rub the surface, um, usually a small stone or maybe a cloth, you rub it, rub it, rub it, and you're essentially knocking off this oxidized copper, exposing little, little mountains, tiny microscopic mountains of gold. You smash that down on the surface. And Micro layer on the surface, and you've got pure gold. So the interior of these things is a mixture, but the surfaces generally are pure gold from this idea. And we try also to focus on the incredible pottery from this culture. And so they were, they were expressive, and they show lots of animals, and in general, if you look at them carefully, they're showing um, composite animals. So they're taking elements of certain animals and kind of putting them together on these sort of Creatures that may represent the myths. Um, um, most of these animals are also shown, if you look carefully, they're shown in movement. So they're, they're, they're slithering, they're moving, their arms and legs are, are uh, moving, they're, they're flying. So they were trying to capture this in, um, in, in this art. And they're focusing on certain animals. And um, the ones that seem to show up the most are animals that transition between different worlds. So um, there are actually a number of frog, into the, could be toads possibly. Um, so when you think of a frog, its lifespan starts off as kind of a little egg in the water, and then you get a little tadpole, and then it develops into a frog or a toad, gets up on land, comes out of the water. Um, it's like uh, the crocodile is um, another core theme, probably one of the most common in the artwork that you see in the exhibit. Um, so, you know, they're great hunters um, in the water. They also come up on land and are very ferocious. Most of the animals tend to, uh, that they're focusing on, have teeth, have fangs, have scales, armor, things like this um, seem to be the things they're focusing on the most. Uh, also, um, uh, jaguars, and uh, they could possibly be the um, Central American cougar or puma. Um, we, we really don't know, um, but some of them appear to be spots on the animals, so probably the jaguar, which is important throughout the tropical regions of the Americas, um, and this, and this is a symbol of um, many different things. Um, one of my, my favorite objects in the exhibit, um, it's not actually not an exhibit, it's a new collection, was a, ba a bag, and the label said cat's paw. What do you mean by cat's paw? So we took it to Kate Moore, she said, yeah, this is a large feline, probably a jaguar, or a Puma, and um, it's the essentially the finger bones or paw bones of the animal. And it, I was hoping that it was sort of all, all kind of intact and it had been part of a skin maybe that they had worn with uh, maybe uh, possibly the skull still attached to the headpiece, maybe coming down the back, and maybe the paws still attached to it. Um, K. 
Kate said that no, that it represents possibly two, maybe three individuals uh, that are represented by this. Um, so they weren't uh, articulated. Um, but certainly something about this animal was important enough to include it in this, um, in this area. One of the most exciting things is that there's current work being done by a Panamanian archaeologist and a Spanish team um, led by Julia Mayo on a site that's located seven kilometers away from Cinco Ponte and um, has um, uh, burials almost identical to the one we have uh, to recover by Penn excavations. And what's so exciting about this is she's using modern recovery techniques. They're even planning to do DNA work on the skeletal remains um, to find this. So she's begun to sort of publish this, and you'll all get a chance to hear her, her work. Um, she'll be coming here, I think, in April or early May to give a lecture at the Penn Museum. So hopefully you can all come and attend to see spectacular finds. And what's exciting is that we can kind of also flesh out some of our excavations from what she's finding also. And you see, um, this is her central burial. Uh, she has many of the same kinds of objects that we found in excavations from many decades earlier. She also found that the burials were probably wrapped in bark cloth. So this is a, a, from a fig tree, and a lot of native peoples in the Americas, they stripped the bark off of these tall tropical trees, they pounded, 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 and they applied it. And it's almost like a, kind of like a flannel um, sub substance that you can paint. It's somewhat waterproof also, and makes great clothing. And we think that she thinks that possibly the bodies were wrapped up very tightly in these. And that there was actually, in one of her burials, there was a structure built over it. She doesn't know how long the structure lasted, but it was um, probably to actually show the burials off for a certain period of time before they filled it in with soil and covered it up. Also, um, there's some evidence at Cinque Conte and uh, the site of El Caño, where she works across the river, um, that these were ceremonial centers. Um, so these were um, special areas for multiple burials of several hundred years. And they were probably, the whole cemetery was lined with these palisade-like upright stones and brought in, in some cases, from fairly long distances uh, to create a ceremonial center to define the sacred space from the outside space. And who were these peoples? So to conclude, you know, uh, we, we give them the name Coplay culture, Coplay peoples. Uh, we don't know exactly who they were. Uh, there are many different groups that um, are descended communities that may or may not be related to these. Many people point to the present day Puna or Buna. And um, the, um, but certainly, you know, their legacy is still here today. Um, we also know that even though the culture changed, so we don't identify it as Cocle after about 1000 AD, all of the elements uh, continued up to the time of Spanish contact, and probably a lot of the descriptions of the Spaniards' eyewitness accounts uh, tell us a bit about what life was like at that time. And um, these were hierarchical societies. Um, they had uh, chiefs and, you know, from the burials and various statistical analyses and done on uh, our burials and also on others, we can define at least three different classes of people within the society. And we also know that these peoples were cosmopolitan in that um, many of the, um, there are many objects that come in from far away, they were placed in tombs like uh, Burial 11 in Cinco Conte, um, the Emerald, probably from either Ecuador or Colombia, um, traded. And these are canoe peoples. So uh, they're living on rivers, they're traversing these rivers up and down. Um, Cinco Ponte was probably a ceremonial center for a good part of Panama at its time. And um, these canoes, even in Dugout Canoes, you, you know your way along the coast. You can go through mangrove swamps and things that kind of protect you from the ocean waves and go north and south. Um, and we also know that by the um, colonial period, these peoples were using ocean-going rafts to traverse um, along the Pacific coast, um, maybe reaching as far south as the southern Empire all the way up to Baja California and then the um, present day United States. Um, one of the things we try to do in this exhibit, even though we don't know exactly who the descendants of these peoples are, um, certainly some of the many groups in Panama today um, relate to the, this past culture. Um, and Lucy Fowler Williams has been looking at the famous Ebolas that are created by the Puna. It's a very vibrant art style. Um, if you travel there, you probably pick these up as a tourist. These are uh, panels that the women create um, in these incredible colors. And you just sew them onto a blouse in the front and the back. And uh, today you buy them sort of separate panels. And what 
Lucy and others have found that many of the designs of these things, if you see them in the exhibit, um, are based roughly on sort of the symmetry and design structure, of, especially what we see on the pots um, and on the surfaces, the interior surfaces of the pots. And um, there's certainly something going on here. But we also know that these things don't go back more than about 200 years ago. So they been about 200 years ago because of our tradition. So how did we get from 500 years before to that period? And uh, we know from Spanish accounts that the women especially um, tattooed their bodies and also did um, body painting, which may have been a way that on the actual human body, these design patterns and sort of art style continued up. One of the reasons I'm so proud to work at the Penn Museum is that many of our collections, certainly not all, uh, come from professionally excavated um, projects, and such as uh, Mesa's project at Cinco Ponte. And so, um, unlike many museums that have collections, almost everybody has something from the Proclay culture from Panama. Um, it's usually one or two objects. They don't know where it came from. They sort of say, well, probably Panama, based on the style, but we don't know what site, we don't know what it was associated with, what individuals it might have been associated with, what it probably comes from various. And we have this incredible way to not only know the context of the objects, but it can be studied um, 50, 60, 70 years after it was recovered. And uh, we expect that this collection will be continued to be studied um, in the near and very distant future. Thank you very much.